Bibles, go to 2 Corinthians. Come across a passage, started thinking about some things and checked it out a couple other places and I thought it was worthy to do it again. You say, well, I've already heard that before. Uh, like you said, turn your phones off, <laughs> down. I was watching this uh, YouTube video one time as a Methodist church and, and they had up there, they had, uh, if you had your cell phone goes off, they had like five or six things that would happen to you if the cell phone, they'd charge you and all kinds of stuff, so you'd have to pay money. And the last one was if it actually went off during the service, you went right to hell. And, and it showed the bottom opening up and somebody falling right through and the flames coming up. And, and Jerry, that's where you'd been, brother. I mean, <laughs> I'm telling you, that's, you're just lucky you're in a Baptist church. I'm telling you, man. <laughs> Second Corinthians chapter 5. I like my Bible. It says, we are confident, verse 8, verse 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, it says, We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and present with the Lord. Wherefore, we labor that whether present or absent, uh, we may be accepted of him. So there's, there's something that you're going to do when this thing happens in your life. Uh, when you get saved, there's, there's a, a thing that takes place uh, that you need to keep working at the thing. It's not, it says, examine yourself whether you be in the faith. You're always working your way there. You, I know I'm not, by works, I'm not saved. I understand that. I got saved in 1980 on a back porch in Louisville, Kentucky. I'm done with that. I'm done. But there is a thing inside, man, that you just constantly want to do something for the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because verse 10 says, for we must all appear. All, not one, everybody that's saved is going to be there. Be uh, before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to, to that he had done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Father, again, thank you for your blessings this morning. Uh, let us uh, get something out of your precious word, and it is a precious book. That old Bible, Lord, is, is a great book, Lord. It's, it's got me through 43 years so far, and, Lord, it'll get me through to the end, and I just want to thank you for that, and it'll get anybody else through that picks it up and lets it get them through. Uh, Father, again, thank you for your blessings this morning. Bless the service, and we'll praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. I know you probably heard messages before on, on the judgment seat of Christ, which is true, uh, but... You know, when you try to make somebody understand that, that verse in there says, knowing therefore the terror, you ought to be scared to death to go stand in front of this thing and have Jesus Christ look at you and tell you that. But I found a perfect example. I listened to another preacher and I seen it and I thought, whoa, man, that's a good example. Go take your Bibles, go back to uh, Genesis chapter 49. Now, brethren, there's, there's a way to approach this judgment seat that just make you just as happy as you can be, or there's going to be a way you're going to approach it that you ain't going to like it at all. Uh, but if you're saved in here today, and now if you're lost, you don't have to worry about it. You're not going to go to the judgment seat of Christ. You're going to go right to the white throne judgment and right to hell. So if you're, not, if you're in here lost today, you know what you need to do is get saved. <laughs> That's what you need to do. Then you need to get scared to death to go stand in front of this one. <laughs> That's just simple. I like it. My Bible's just a simple thing. You say, are you sure? Yeah, man. It says being confident. That's what it said over there, being confident. I got out of hell 43 years ago, 1980. I got out of hell. I got a hell free, I got a uh, do not pass hell, do not go, you don't get $200, you don't have to worry. I got a get out of hell free card, man. Looks like one of those monopoly things. Got it at the house, I show it to the Lord. Uh, Jacob, verse 49, chapter 49, it says right here, verse 1 and 2, it says, And Jacob called uh, unto his sons and said, Gather yourselves together, that I may tell you that which shall befall you in the last days. Gather yourselves together and hear, ye sons of Jacob, and hearken unto Israel your father. He had 12 sons, and he got them all together. And his 12 sons, I'm telling you what, these are some shady guys. But, you know, when you start looking down that list of names, uh, you start seeing some likenesses of us in there. Uh, you're going to find yourself in one of these people in here. And each one of them had to walk before Jacob in front of his brethren and give an account of his life to their dad. Now, their dad uh, had a son named Joseph, and way back when they... they Stuck Joseph in a pit and, and uh, sold him off to the Ishmaelites. And uh, the Midianites took him down and sold him off and all that stuff. Never told their dad about it. And all of a sudden, that stuff come to light. But what you'll find is in this passage, that is really not even what's being considered here. What's being considered in this passage is things that people did that they did not take care of or could have taken care of and handled it along the path. David was down at Keala one day. And Saul was chasing him, and he was in the city, and he thought, oh, surely, man, these people will take care of me. So David did the right thing. He got down on his knees and said, oh, Lord. He goes, is, is Saul going to come to Keilah and, and get me? And the Lord says, yep, he's going to come and get you. 
And then he goes, well, let me ask you the second question. If he comes to get me, are the men of Keilah going to give me up? And the Lord says, yep, they're going to give you up. You know what David does? He leaves. <laughs> you know, you don't have to, just because the future has been told about you, that's one of many futures. And the future that you have is your future, and you can do whatever you want with it. Uh, Dave, jo, uh, Ju, Judah, or Jacob, is getting ready to start down this list of his sons, and he's going to tell them what's going to befall them in the last days. Uh, you know, those, I think those boys could have changed some of that stuff and, and made it not happen. But he sits there, he says, gather you, verse 2, he says, gather yourselves together and hear, ye sons of Jacob, and hearken unto the voice on Israel, your father. Jacob, Jacob is getting ready to tear him up. And his sons did some things that they should not have done. And, and he's making them, it's, it's reckoning. The day of reckoning is coming. Uh, one of these days, we're all going to die, and we're going to go to the judgment seat of Christ. I am. And there's going to be a day of reckoning for me at that judgment seat. And I'm a son of God. I can take you right through the Bible. I'm a son. I'm a priest. I'm a saint. I'm a king. I'm all that stuff. I'm going to be standing before the king of kings and lord of lords, and he's going to be looking at me, and he, in front of all my brethren, are gonna be, now I'm going to be there all by myself in front of him. But, and there ain't going to be nobody to answer for me. I'm saved. I'm there. But there's going to be all my brethren for all eternity is going to be back there listening to everything that, that the Lord is going to bring up against me there if he brings anything up or things I did wrong. And he's going to make me pay. Wood, hay, and stubble going to burn up. Uh, gold, silver, precious stone, I'm going to get through. And he's going to look at that stuff. He says, Mike, that was wood. That was steady. We all got wood. If you think that you're in here today and you have no wood, hay, and stubble, then you got something... You, I don't see no halos at this moment. So as far as I'm concerned, there's a lot of wood, hay, and stubble around me. I got, I got plenty of wood, hay, and stubble that I'm trying to get rid of. Jacob is, is warning his sons, this is your future. And you can change your future if, if Keilah, if the men of Keilah was going to hang. And the Lord said, yep, you're going to be delivered. To me, that's pretty much you're over a toast. You might as well Calvinism, you might as well lay down and just sit there and wait till he comes and get you. David was a smart man. He said, no, I ain't going to wait. I'm just going to get up and I'm going to go somewhere else. Amen. That's the way to do it, man. You know, if somebody comes up and tells you, if you, I had a cop one time tell me, he said, you're in the wrong place at the wrong time, and he locked me up. And he was perfectly right. To this day, I'm not mad at that guy at all. He was absolutely right. I shouldn't have been where I was at. And you know what he did? He locked me up. I had another one one day. He, he let me go. He said, son, you're in the wrong place. You need to get out of here. I said, well, I'm here to get my brother. He goes, well, get your brother and get out of here. I got my brother and I left. Uh, you know what? I didn't go to jail that day. You say, what is it? I did what he said do. And when, they, when the warning, you know, I feared that police. I could have said, hey, man, I'm an American citizen, and I can do whatever I want to do. And I'd have went right to jail. <laughs> if that's what you want to do, fine, go for it. No, no, I prefer not to go to jail. I did. Now, I was a young man. No, you got to watch what you say. You got to, I think it was Jesse or Esther went to school one time. And, and when I was 16, I stole a car and, and, uh, took it to West Virginia and left it there and, and uh, all those hitchhiking back got locked up and I went to jail for like 18, 19 days, my dad, 13, 14 days, whatever it was, my dad left me there. Taught me a valuable lesson. I never want to go back there ever again. Uh, and so I, I told my kids that story and Esther went to, I thought, was it Esther? She went to school over there when she was going to Cornerstone. My dad got locked up for stealing a car <laughs> and made it sound like it was today. <laughs> so then the, the school teacher calls Beth, is Mike in jail? No, no, that was when he was a kid. But uh, sometimes you got to clarify that stuff, brother. I mean, you just can't tell people you go to jail and, and you make it sound like, you know, some, somebody will put that out on the internet. Elliot's in jail <laughs> for stealing a car, the wicked man. I knew he was wicked. You know, Jacob is sitting here and he's calling. Jacob is the perfect picture of Jesus Christ here. And he's calling his sons up in front of him one at a time, Amen. starting at the eldest and taking them all the way down to the youngest. And he's saying, guys, this is what... First of all, you lied to me. I mean, that's enough right there that a good dad should just beat the snot out of all of them. Uh, and, I mean, you lied to me and told me my son was dead. And here he is second to Pharaoh. That, that doesn't even come into the picture. You know why? Because they got that thing covered. Joseph, they apologized to Joseph. They, they asked for forgiveness. Joseph forgave them. That was gone. But, you know, sometimes we have stuff in our lives, brother, that's going to come up at the judgment seat of Christ, and you better figure out a way. To, I'll tell you how. To, by the time I get done, I'm going to show you how to get rid of it. Jacob says there, uh, Bible-believing Christians, you know what? We get, we get frustrated and mad and angry. And, and I, I'm, I'm an angry, Beth calls me an angry bird all the time. I don't mean to be angry. I try not to be angry. I try to be pleasant and nice. 
and have everybody love me, but that doesn't always work. My grandkids look at me strange like, they laugh at you, but they don't want you to hold them and stuff. And that's strange too. No, they're all getting used to me now. Uh, but, but when you sit here, uh, our, we're Bible-believing Christians, and, and we got fed the Word of God. And we've been fed, if you've been around a Bible-believing church very long, you've been fed some stuff that, I mean, after you hear it, it's kind of hard. You know, blessing is, Miss, Miss Williams back there, she, she'll say, well, this, 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 and this. And I'm like, yeah, man, she's got it. She's getting it. She's getting it. I mean, solid as it could be. Uh, probably in five or six more years, she'll be preaching up here. I'm just joking. Don't you even try to preach. <laughs> Mike that I could preach. No, I, I'm taking, I retract that, I retract it. <laughs> but I'm telling you, brother, and you know what I'm telling you, it's, it's an amazing thing when the, the more word of God you get, after a while you'll, you'll say, if you quit, you'll just quit. I've seen more Christians, I have in the 42 years, 43 years, I've seen more Christians just quit. Uh, here recently a, a man left his church and, and never came back, never went to another church. I'm like, okay, if I'm wrong, that's fine, I got it, man. I'm no good, I stink, I'm terrible. But, but that shouldn't keep you from loving Jesus. It shouldn't stop you. It shouldn't stop you. You should go find someplace else to go to. That's what I did. And, and you never quit. You know why? Because you learn stuff from, I've had sitting a preacher one time. He called me in his office. And a big preacher in town. He goes, Mike, I can teach you nothing. He said, you got a Bible education. He laid it out in front of me. I said, no, sir, you taught me all kinds of stuff. <laughs> I said, I, I know how to run buses. I know how to ride a bus. I said, I get seasick ride a bus. Don't like buses. I said, but I know how to be on a bus route. I know how to go out and talk to people. I said, I, I watched you do a church. I said, you got a church, five, six, seven, eight hundred people. I could never do that. Not, not right now. I couldn't. And I'm sitting there watching. I said, so brother, I learned all kinds of stuff. I've got a college education watching somebody. You can learn something from just about anything, but you got to have that fear inside of you sometime that I'm going to stand before God and I need to learn something. You know what's wrong with Jacob's boys? They didn't fear their dad. You know, what, you know what Joseph did? He feared. Now, he got a little arrogant, but he feared. <laughs> he was on his daddy's side. He knew exactly. Jacob, Jacob, well, we consider somebody. Uh, so, you know what, we just tend to quit and just go off the wayside and say, I know everything. You never can't do that. Just don't ever do that. Stay, stay there. The title of this message is Changing the Future. Jacob is going to list out to his kids some things that they could have changed, and they could still change until the day they died, but they never did. Verse 3 says, Reuben, thou art my firstborn, my might, and the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity, and the excellency of power. Reuben starts out great. He's his firstborn. In the Old Testament, the firstborn child gets everything. The firstborn is the one all the stuff goes into. He's going to take his daddy's place. Isaac took Jacob's place, or uh, Isaac took Abraham's place. Jacob took Isaac's place. And and Jacob kind of cheated to get the thing, and Esau lost it. Uh, Esau could have corrected some things he never did. But Reuben is sitting here and says, the beginning of my strength, the firstborn, everything goes his way. It's going his way. He's got excellency of dignity. Dignity is as a way of appearing or behaving that suggests seriousness and self-control. You know what's wrong with a lot of Christians today? We have no self-control. We, we, we have lost that thing inside of us that we're ambassadors for Jesus Christ and we're supposed to be looking like he looks and we've lost that thing and I think I can just do whatever I want to do and you can't. I'm sorry. I would like to say you can go out and do whatever you want to do. As a Christian, now I'll, I'll say it and go out and somebody will clip this and say, look, Mike said you can do whatever you want to do. Uh, you can go out and get drunk as a Christian and go right to heaven. You can go out and do all kinds of stuff and go right to heaven, but it's just going to look really, really bad on you and you're going to stand before the judge of Christ one day and give an account of that. You say, why? Because the testimony, you're, you're an ambassador for Jesus Christ. A good ambassador for the United States does something wrong, they get fired. That's just what happens. In the United States Navy, they wanted us to be ambassadors. Ambassadors. You know what fear is? I'll tell you what fear is. I just thought of that. I, got, I went to the Navy in 1980 and got a, uh, took a whole series of ASVAB tests. And I got like a 64, maybe 65, something, 63, 4, 5. And six years later, when I got out of the Navy, they made me retake those tests. Well, I needed a 63 or 5 or whatever to become an ET. Well, I'm already an ET. I don't have to worry about becoming no ET. I'm already that. Uh, but i got to take these tests again, and if I don't pass these things, I'm not going to be an ET when I go back in. You know how scared to death I was going to fail that test? Here I am, been in the Navy for six years, fixed everything on flat, uh, pointing in the flat in just about any ship out there, worked at a satellite station, did all kinds of stuff, knew all kinds of, passed every test. And when I went to take that test in 1986, I thought, I was, oh, God, I'm going to fail this test, <laughs> and they're not going to let me be an ET no more. I'm going to be a postman chipping paint. I 
was scared, man. I mean, when I sit down and take that test, I really took that test, man. I was like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I got a 96 on that thing. I asked them, I said, why did I get a 96? They said, because you actually learned something in the six years you were here. You should have had a 96 to start with, but you didn't. He goes, you barely got in. He goes, but, but I tell you what, you know, that's fear. I was afraid, and I love the Navy. I was afraid they weren't going to let me go back in and do the job I was doing. I was scared, man. And I got, I got, the Lord taught me a lesson right here. He says, are you scared of me like that? I wasn't afraid the Navy was going to hurt me. I wasn't afraid the Navy wasn't going to like me. I just was afraid I wasn't going to be able to do the job I wanted to do in the Navy. The Navy loved me. I loved them. It was a love, 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 love thing. But I tell you what, I was, I was afraid because there were standards that you had to have. And uh, you had to have qualifications to do what you were going to do. You know what the Lord has? He has some standards for us. Nobody wants to, everybody wants to just go out and do whatever they want to do. I'm sorry, hey, I'm, I'm going to offend some people right now. Coming to church in flip-flops is just not what you should do. I think you ought to come to church with a pair of tennis shoes on. Let's upgrade to tennis shoes in winter. How about that? Coming to church with shorts on. Yeah, and you're going, and she's in the dress. Well, I tell you what, if you go to your wedding and you walk in with, I've seen people, oh, I've seen, it'll never happen in this church, by the way. <laughs> never, ever, ever. Uh, ladies need to look like ladies when they get married. That husband should look, first of all, ladies, if your husband don't look like a husband when y'all get married, you don't need to marry him. If he comes in in shorts and wants to get married in shorts, it ain't going to happen here. It ain't going to happen. There is something. You, you should have a suit and tie on or, or something, man. Go out and spend a few bucks. Get a job, man, so you can get a tuxedo. But if you, will, if you will dress up to get your bride, why won't you dress up when your husband comes to get you? Because if I am the bride of Christ, why do I care? Why, why am I fighting? I don't have to. You know all that is? What it is is you're looking at me and not him. I always looked at the Lord on that stuff. I don't look at anybody. I could care less what anybody thinks. I wear what I wear for him. I don't wear it. I've asked my wife sometimes, I said, why do you wear what's just for you? I'm like, you liar. <laughs> she goes, no, and she does. A lot of the stuff she wears, she wears for me. Well, then should not I consider what I'm wearing for him? We lose that fear. We lose that fear. You know what, you know what Reuben had? He had no fear of his dad. Jacob comes back. Now, could you imagine? I don't think Jacob, I'm really honestly, as a dad, I don't think Jacob stood here in front of his kids looking for this opportunity to slam them. I don't think he was looking for that. These are my kids. These are my, my offsprings. This is my, my inheritance that's going to go down to these guys. I want to, you know, the Lord Jesus Christ, the uh, judgment of Christ, I don't think he's going to be looking for pleasure in bringing up the things that we should take care of. You know what you got? The Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom I will send. He will bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I've said to you. You know when you get in trouble, you, that Holy Spirit brings it right to your mind. And you know what you should do right there is take care of that thing. And he gives you a way to do it. Why? Because he's trying to get you when you get up there, you're nice and clean and pretty when you walk in and you look great. But sometimes, brethren, we just want to do it. Reuben, unstable as water. That's his eldest. Thou shalt not excel. That's Jacob talking about his son. You won't do it, man. I'm done. I'm done with you. He goes, because thou wentest up to my father's bed. He, thy father's bed. He went, Jacob had a, a, a wife, Leah and Rachel and a couple concubines. And he went up to one of the concubines and, and did what he did and got in trouble. Jacob, oh man, <laughs> do I have that verse? Go to, go to Genesis. Go to Genesis, Genesis, Genesis 34. Genesis 34. Jacob had some grace, man. You know, the Lord has a lot of grace with us. He has tons and tons of grace. Uh, Jacob 34, 1. No, it's not 34. That's, that's, uh, that's Reuben. I got the wrong. It's, it's back here somewhere. Jacob, Jacob, I'll have the verse here. It'll probably pop in my head in a few minutes. Jacob knew what Reuben had done. 25, 30, 40 years earlier, he knew what he'd done. Never did anything about it. Reuben never, man, I don't know about you, but have you ever been to a place where somebody calls you up here and you know you've done something wrong and you're afraid they're going to bring it up? And you're just, you know, the best thing to do is just deal with it and just spill the guts, spill your guts, get it out, man. Now, I'll be honest with you. If your problem is between you and God, that's where you need to keep it, between you and the Lord, right there. 
If it's between you and somebody else, take it there, get it under the blood, move on, and let it go. What a lot of people do is they try to just stir stuff up and stir stuff up and stir stuff up and stir stuff up and stir. Stuff up and stir. Oh, by the way, ladies, all those, these, these are 12 men. You fit in these characteristics of these men. So don't think I'm just talking to men here. I'm talking to all of us. Uh, Reuben, Reuben starts good, but man, he does something wrong. And for 40 years, he had the opportunity to go to his daddy and straighten that thing out. He never did. This thing right here, if, he, if they sold Joseph into captivity and Jacob forgave that, do you not think he would have forgave the other thing? But you don't want to do that, man. You're, you're hard, you're stiff-necked and hard-headed. Well, because you're that unstable as water, thou shalt not excel, because thou went us to the father's bed and then defiled us dead. He went up to my couch. He slammed him. They, he should have not done that. You know what he did? He had an opportunity to get the thing right, and he didn't do it. Verse 5, Simeon. Simeon and Levi. Dinah, their little sister, went out and did what she shouldn't have done. They, Mom and Dad, you shouldn't let your kids out there run around in places they shouldn't be running around. So what did J Jacob do? He let Dinah go out to the people of the land. And she got involved with a young man out there, and something happened, and her two brothers got mad. Actually, all of her brothers got mad. These two got real mad. They got real, real mad. Their dad said, no, don't do anything. Let me deal with it. And he got to all of them and says, look, I cannot let my daughter marry somebody that is uncircumcised and not what we believe. And that whole city did, all the men in that city did exactly what Jacob said. They were going to do exactly, because that man loved that young lady, and he wanted her to be his wife, and he was willing to do anything to the point where he got everybody in the city to do what he was doing. Am I saying it's right? I'm not saying it's right. I'm just saying the young man did what he could to do right. Levi and Simeon did not. Levi and Simeon went there, and after they got all the, they were circumcised, they were hurting, they went there and killed every man in the place. And Jacob said, you make me sink. He goes, Simeon and Levi are brethren, verse 5, 49.5. Simeon and Levi are brethren. Instruments of cruelty are in their habitation. O oh, my soul, come not thou into their secret, unto their assembly. Mine honor be not uh, thou, uh, mine honor uh, be not thou united, for in their anger they slew a man, and in their self will they dig down a wall. You know, some people has a self will, and all they care about is himself. They, that's all they care about. Le Levi and Simeon, all they cared about was their own stinking selves. They didn't care about nobody else around them. They didn't care what anybody else thought. They didn't care about what they were doing. And number two, they did not care what their dad said. You know, there's so many of us like that today. And one of these days, brother, we're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And we're going to give an account. We say we're saved. All right, then, are you acting like you're saved? Are you acting like a Christian? Because you're going to have to give an account. I'm going to have to give an account of my actions in heaven one day before Jesus Christ. And everybody in all eternity is going to be watching. And there will be zero excuses. You know, one of these, none of these boys could sit there and say a word back to Jacob. Not a word. You know what's going to be? One of these days we're going to stand in front of Jesus and you will not have a word back to him. There will not be, you will, everything he says is going to be right down the line. It's going to be accurate as it could be. Everything's going to be correct. It's going to be in a book. The books are going to be written and he's going to bring that thing up in front of you and you're not going to be able to say nothing. And all your brethren are going to see exactly what you've done. They're probably already going to know it anyways. Some of them back here are going to say, I knew he was guilty of all that. <laughs> you wait till you get up there. You won't like that one. <laughs> he finishes poor, poorly. You know why he finishes poorly? Lack of character. He had no courage. He had no courage. The, neither one of these boys had enough courage to listen to what their dad said. They didn't have enough character to believe that their dad is in control of the thing and let him control it. That's what they're supposed to do. They had no convictions. They, they were going to do what I'm going to do. My dad don't know what he's doing. I'm going to do what I want to do. And I'm to, they shouldn't do that to my sister. Why'd you let her go out there to start with? You didn't care enough about her when she went out there by herself. Now all of a sudden you care? Yeah, I doubt that. They had no commitment. If they were committed to the Lord like they should have been, Jacob, I think, was committed. You know, Jacob took 20 years to figure out what, what he messed up and straighten some things out. And he got it straight. He came back thinking that uh, Esau was going to kill him. And when he, when he, on his way back, man, he did everything. He said, drove, a drove, a drove, and sent stuff out there, and gifts, and all kinds of stuff. You know what he wanted to do? He wanted to take care of the problem before he got there to see Esau. And you know what he did? He took care of the problem. Esau came and said, brother, I have enough. I don't need, Esau's anger was gone. It was abated. It was, it was over. 
Uh, and, and Jacob was like, no, no, please take it. And what Jacob was doing was just getting the load off of him. 20 years he sat down there with Laban. 20 years worried about Esau. You know, Esau didn't probably care one bit after Jacob was out of his face. And then he goes on and lives his life. But one of these days, payday someday, we got to go stand before him. Simeon and Levi, bad guys. They refused to heed their father's instructions. He said their instruments are cruelty. What we say sometimes is, uh, the Bible is a sharp, he says your tongue is like a sword. You ever watch what comes out of your mouth? Sometimes we say stuff we should never say. Sometimes it could be true. It's still, you got to debate, should I still say that? Just because something's true don't mean I need to say it. And we do it, man. Blah, 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 blah. Not caring about what anybody says or anybody, just like, I can say whatever I want. You're a Levi and a Simeon. And one of these days, you'll stand before Jesus Christ to get an account of that mouth or those actions. You don't want to do that. Then you go down to see Judah, verse 8. Judah, Judah is a good guy, man. Judah, thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise. Thy hand shall be uh, in the neck. Could you imagine, just envision yourself standing before God and, and the Lord Jesus Christ starting to rattle this stuff off. Thy hand shall be in, on the neck of thine enemies. Thy father's children shall bow down to thee. He, number one, he's, he's going to receive praise. Number two, he's going to be the victor. He's going to be able to control his enemies. And then he's going to be a leader of his people. That's what, Judah, that's what Jacob is saying about him. He goes, because, you know why? Now, here you go. Here's, here's the key here. Here's the key. Judah did the exact same thing that Reuben did. Judah had three sons. And... Onan, Onan, Ur, and uh, I forget the other kid's name. But anyways, the first two kids, he, he gave a, a young lady named Tamar to his oldest son. His oldest son died. He didn't have no kids. And then he gave, her, gave uh, that to his young next son, and he refused to do it, so he died. God killed him. Then he had a young boy, and he said, he so told Tamar, he said, Tamar, he said, chill out, man. Just wait a while. I know you're, you're uh, 47 or 50 or whatever it is, and he's only three. So just wait a while, and he'll get up to age, and I'll give you him, and, and you can have a baby by him. Well, that never happened. And Tamar started getting ticked because Jacob, uh, Judah lied to her. So Judah, Judah goes out to shear some sheep, and he, he finds this uh, hard looking lady on the side of the road. But that was Tamar. She was all dressed up. She knew exactly how to, ladies know exactly how to dress, guys. So, y'all, I mean, they'll get you in a heartbeat. You better watch out. We're like, we're like fish, man. They put a piece of bait on the hook and we just get caught. But anyways, uh, she got him. I still have a problem with it. How did you not know that was Tamar? Number two, Jacob, how did you not know that was Leah? I have, there's some things I'm, in the Bible when I get to heaven, I got like, Lord, you've got to show me some things. However, he goes down there and he does what he does and, and she gets pregnant. And he walks away and and three months later, he finds out that Tamar is pregnant, but he didn't know it was by him. And they were going to burn her. And they bring her in front of him. And she says, oh, by the way, the person that got me pregnant, this is his staff and signet and ring and bracelets. And Judah looked at that and said, thou art more righteous than I am. He goes, you got me there, man. She's right. That's me. That's me. That's me. I'm guilty. You know what he did? He got that thing under the blood. He, he took that thing, and his dad knew about that. You know what? Right here, when you get this thing, Judah promised to Tamar. He didn't do any of that stuff, and because he, he did the right thing, that thing is not brought up here in this passage. Judah, is, he did the exact same thing, but, but Reuben did not take care of the problem. What I'm trying to get you to see today, brethren, is you need to take care of some problems before you get there. I think, I think we're getting ready to head out here at No Time Flat. I don't think you've got much time at all. Now, you, I, it could be another 55,000 years. I have no idea, but I don't think it's going to be much more than 55 seconds. I believe we're out on our way out. And this, the, what we're going to do is we're going to be standing before him soon. And, brethren, you don't have to be standing. It's just like, just like David. If I know, just like these boys, if I know, you know what? I, let me do one more here. <laughs> Judah. Judah was a good guy, man. He's going to be praised. I want to I go, go down to Joseph. Zebulun, Iskar. The, all these boys have different. It's getting late. I'm going I'm to shut up. All these boys have different characteristics. And each one of them, some of them are just normal, everyday people. They just live. I, I like, uh, who is it, Iskar? Is it Iskar or Zebulun? No, it's Gad. Gad. No, Asher. 
That's not the one I want. Let me look at. I want Joseph. I'm going to do Joseph here in just a second. But there was one of these guys, Dan. Zebulun, Zebulun, Zebulun. Yeah, Issachar. Issachar is a strong ass couching. How would you like your daddy to call you that? I ain't going to say it again because if I do, somebody will get offended. <laughs> Issachar. He goes, Issachar is a strong ass crouching down. I lied, so I'm going to say it anyways. Crouching down between two burdens. And he saw that rest was good and the land was pleasant and he bowed his shoulder to bear and he became a servant of tribute. He's a hard worker. You don't hear a lot about him. Doesn't say a whole bunch, but he just said, hey man, that boy's a, he saw good. He saw good. He saw pleasant things. He got in the yoke. You know what the Lord says? He says, take my yoke upon you. He got right in the yoke and you know what he did? He said he became a servant. He chose to become a servant. That's what he did. He did good. Then you got Joseph. Joseph, Joseph is, is, uh, is the typical good old guy, the good Christian man that gets to heaven and you don't have much to answer. Joseph, verse 22. I'll stop it right after this one and I'll finish what I'm going to say. Joseph. Joseph is a fruitful bow, even a fruitful. This is what Jacob said about his son. In front of all of his other. First of all, I, I don't mind the Lord saying, hey, Mike, you're not, you're not the greatest, but you're not the worst. I would be okay if he says, hey, you're a great door polisher. Uh, I'd, rather be, I'd rather polish the doorknobs in heaven than I don't have to be great. I just want the Lord to be pleased with what he wanted me to do. He never, if he never wanted me to be a great preacher, then I shouldn't try to be that great preacher. Well, maybe I should try to be one, but, but I shouldn't get mad if I don't become that. I want to do exactly what the Lord wants me to do. I want to be happy with what he wants me to do, not what somebody else wants me to do. If I can make the Lord happy, I've done everything, man. I'll tell you what. You say, why would you do that? Because he knows exactly what I need down through life. And if I keep trying to please him, guess what? I just got the strangest feeling that he's going to please me as I walk through this life with him. I can't guarantee everything's going to happen perfectly in somebody's life. There may be trials and tribulations that pop up in our lives that there's just no cure for sometimes. I was reading a passage here, the sin unto death, and I kept saying, what in the world is a sin unto death? You know, there's some things I think you do or I do that last your whole life, and you'll never get rid of those things, and you'll just have to live with those things in your life until the Lord takes you out of this body, and you'll be done with that thing. But until then, that thing's going to ride with you and 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 just tear you down, and, and you just got to get through it. You say, why? Because the Lord knows that maybe some of those things keep you out of trouble. I don't know why God does what he does. I don't know why the Lord allows in our life what he does, but he does. Jacob starts talking about his son. If there's one thing that sons hate is to have another son lifted up. They didn't like Joseph at the beginning. He comes in there with his multicolored coat. Today, they, <laughs> that wouldn't be a good idea today. Jacob probably have a different coat. Um, but no, he wouldn't. He would have he killed the other people. But the, you can see they're going to get mad about that stuff. You can't say homosexuality is wrong, even though the Bible says it, because people get mad. I'm only repeating what God said. So since I'm on God's side, I like what he said more than what anybody else said, so I'll take what he says, and then I'll take the hit for it. I don't care. Jacob, Jacob gave his son a multicolored coat, and that coat was made handmade for his son. The other 11 boys got all mad. Here comes Joseph. Now, I mean, Joseph egged that thing on, because I know we're not all perfect. Joseph comes in and says, hey, guys, how do you like my coat? You like that, man? It fits really good all the way around. Just made for, just for me. He goes, you know what are the colors? Hey, Dad told me why he put all these colors in here. And he told me what each color means. You want to know? No, we don't want to know. That was just a micism. Then he goes, oh, by the way, I had this dream. And you all going to bow down to me one day. <laughs> now, what do you think those other 11 boys started thinking about him? I think even, even Jacob was had, Judah was having a problem with him. And, and then he goes, okay, then he goes, guess what? By the way, I had another dream. And now all y'all and the, the 12, the moon and the stars, the sun and the stars, the sun and the moon and the 12 stars are going to, the stars are all going to bow down to me. He goes, what do you think about that? They just get madder and madder. But they didn't have to do to him what they did. Joseph, Jacob, when he got a hold of him, he goes, Joke, Joseph is a fruitful bow. Even a fruitful bough by a well whose branches run over the walls. Man, I mean, he has him just growing everywhere. The archers have sorely grieved him and shot at him and hated him. But his bow abode in strength, and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. You know what made Joseph strong is the things he went through. 
Sometimes we try to get out of going through trials and tribulations, and sometimes those trials and tribulations are exactly what we need to get us to where we need to be. Joseph needed all that stuff in his life. Even by the God of thy fathers who shall help thee, and by his almighty, uh, and by the almighty who shall bless thee with blessings of heaven above and blessings of the deep that lieth under and blessings of the breast and, and of the womb. The blessings of thy father have prevailed above the blessings of my progenitors, unto the uttermost bounds of the everlasting hills. They shall be on the head of Joseph and on the crown of his head of him, on the crown of the head of him that was separated from his brethren. You know, sometimes you have to get away to grow up. I think I had to get away to grow up uh, to where I could be what I am today. I think I just had to get completely away uh, just to let some things pass in my life through. The, so it was just me and the Lord to talk. He was a fruitful bow. That means he, he had fruit abounding all about him. Even a fruitful bough by a well. He's always by a, a, a well of water, and, and he's, he's likening Joseph to this plant at this thing. But then he goes, whose branches run over the walls. He goes, man, you don't take, take care of just yourself, but you're taking care of things on the other side of the wall. Always kept a clean slate. Joseph never let things build up. He took care of everything. He never, I mean, he had issues with his brothers, but he tried to keep those things uh, where it, nobody knew that there was a problem there. you got to take care of problems. If you don't take care of problems, they will come up. Man, <laughs> don't, here you go. I got, oh, I got a verse here, man. You want a verse. You want my favorite verses in the whole Bible. All of them. I like them all, man. Dude, 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 give me a second. I'm, I'm working my way there. I'm going to get there in just a second. Six things, yay. Okay, the Lord says this. There are six things. Now, you, you want to try to straighten your life up, I'm going to tell you how to do it. Watch this right here. If you read your Bible, you're going to know this. These six things that the Lord hate. He doesn't just dislike them. He hates them. Not immensely dislikes. He hates them. A proud look. No, no, no. no. These six things does the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an, abomina an abomination. My mom the other day said, what's an abomination? I said, mom, it's worse than a mortal sin. She's Catholic. <laughs> a proud look. You think you're something? God hates a proud look. He hates somebody who even looks proud. Pride is a, is a man, it's a, the father of the devil is the father of pride, children of pride. A lying tongue. You know, if you say something that isn't true, it's called a lie. I don't know if you know that. The definition for that is like something that's not true. Uh, you need to make sure that what you say is true before you say it, because it's a lie. God hates a proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood. Hopefully there's nobody in here killing anybody. A heart that despises wicked imagination. You know, when you sit there and say, I'm going oh, to do this, I'm going to do that, I'm going to do this. He hates that. Feet that be swift in running to mischief. That's mean you're, you're quick and rapid to cause trouble. That's what God hates it. He hates it. A false witness that speaketh lies. That's twice he talked about lying. He hates, immensely he hates. And he that soweth discord amongst the brethren. Seven things God hates. You say, what is, you know what you need to do? Take that list right there, put them up in front of you, and say, mm, I need to work on all of these. Because one of these days, we're going to have to answer for everything we've done. And that right there, if you sow discord amongst the brethren, that means in this body right here, you're sowing discord, there's a danger. There's a danger to you on that. And if you don't pay for it in this life, you will pay for it when you stand before Jesus Christ. Joseph always made sure he had a, a short list. He never had anything. He gets thrown and he gets, you know, he never complained. Never complained one time. And, I, and I've said this before, always kept a clean slate. Never complains about anything. He shows off a little bit. Yeah, that's, that's a problem. You can say, oh, that's a problem. But hey, if your daddy gave you a nice rainbow coat, you'd wear it. Well, maybe not today, but you would wear it. It may be in the closet somewhere. I don't want to see your rainbow coat today if you got one. But I'm telling you what, if you had something special that was given to you, you would show it off. And, and he, he knew he was aggravating them. He gets thrown in a pit, sold to the Midianites, sold to Potiphar, placed in prison, elevated to second place, never went after his adversaries. Second place to the Pharaoh, he could have got everybody who caused him problems. He could have started with his brothers as they came in. He could have just locked them all up and had them killed and been done with it. He didn't do it. Never went after his brethren. Never went after him. Potiphar and all the other people, he never went after. He could have got the baker and said, or the butler and said, look, man, you forgot all about me. I'm going to throw you in prison for two years and see how you like it. 
He goes, I got you out and you never got me out. But he didn't do a thing. Always served. Well, here's what I always liked. He always served and always did that which was right to his master. When he was under Pharaoh, he did exactly what Pharaoh needed done. He was looking out for the good of Pharaoh. You say, what happened? He saves Egypt out of the thing. That whole nation that had Jacob and all of the kids, when he, the nation of Israel eventually goes down there, and they get thrown into, well, they're down there now, to, but they're getting they're going thrown into that. He's taking care of them and feeding them and making sure that they have food when nobody else on the planet does. And he saves his brothers and sisters that was mean to him, that took him down. Joseph, Joseph is the perfect picture of somebody. You know, when we get to the judgment seat of Christ, I'm, I'm going to stop right there. I, I, I could go to each one of these boys, but I'm not going to do it. Each one of them has a characteristics of their, something about them that is like us. Dan, Dan out, of the, out of Gad come uh, uh, Elijah. Man, I'll tell you what, there's some men that came out of these groups that, that could have changed. The, the, the sons of J uh, Jacob could have changed their destinies. You wouldn't want Joseph to change his, but everybody else had some things they could change. And the, the nation of Israel would have still been there today, just like they were back then. But no, they didn't. They start, kept going right down the path, warned. You know, the Lord gives us a warning, and he tells us, he said, You're, one of these days, he said, for everyone's going to stand before. Take your Bibles, go back over to 2 Corinthians. I'll stop right here. We'll all stand, all, all. If you're in this room today and you're saved, I said at the very beginning of this message, you're going to stand before Jesus Christ. If you're lost, you're going to stand before the white throne judgment. There's two of them. And you don't want that second one. He says, knowing, he goes, for we must, verse 10, for we must all appear, all, all, every single one of us. You're going to have to answer for yourself. You could do whatever you want to do. I'm going to, I'm going to clarify that. You could do whatever you want to do. But you will have to answer to Jesus Christ for it. The question here is, is why would you want to do what you want to do when Jesus Christ could have done what he wanted to do, but for my benefit, for my sake, he came 2,000 years ago. He lived, he served, and he died on the cross of Calvary so I could get to heaven. And then he's taken the time and grace. That's like Jacob. Jacob took grace for all those years. When he found out what those 11 boys had done to his son, I mean, right there could have been the end of that for them. But he never even mentions that. He said, there's other things that you guys should have took care of that you didn't take care of. You know what God's doing? He's given us a space of time to take care of some things that need to be taken care of. I'd like to get, get the organ player and the piano player up here for a few minutes. We're going to have an invitation. If you've got some things, man, that just pop it in your head, you know what you ought to do? You ought to be taking care of those things. You shouldn't let them build up and build up. There's no need for them to build up in your life. They don't need to be there because you're going to answer for those things. You say, well, I, there is nothing on this planet that anybody could possibly do to me or you that would warrant you taking that thing to the cross, taking it to the Calvary, taking it, forget Calvary, taking it to the uh, judgment of Christ. It doesn't need to be there. You know, what I, I know there's people that you may have issues with, but brethren, in the body of believers, you know the Lord has us all sitting here because he has things working out in our lives, and we're supposed to work them out. And those seven things right there, he says he hates them. You know, if you're guilty of any of those, he hates that. And what do you think his, his reaction is going to be to us when we walk before his throne? You're not going to be able to say, well, I didn't know. No, no, he's going to say, Mike quoted that verse to you, read that verse to you that day. Do you, you remember that verse? If you're within hearing range of me, you ought to be on your knees saying, Lord, there's things. I don't know about you. I've sold discord between, um, amongst the brethren. I have done that. I have lied. Have you? I haven't killed anybody. At least I don't think so. It scares me, man. When I was uh, lost and I did some things. Uh, people could have died. You don't, you don't know what you have done in this life. But there's some things the Lord says, hey, now that you're saved, you know, you know, you know. And there's no excuse. Father, thank you for your blessings. Lord, this message, I could have taken it on and on and on. And Lord, all of these boys had things going wrong with them. Joseph was the example, and Judah, Judah was the example. Lord, Judah got some things right, and uh, Lord, uh, in our story, uh, Jacob didn't even bring that up. Reuben, Lord, didn't get some things right, and the thing was brought up. Lord, one of these days, you said we're all going to stand before you and have to give an account of ourselves uh, to you, Lord. And, and, Lord, we just don't have to do that. There's verses over there, First John, 
If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. First John 2, 1 says that we have an advocate with the Father. Lord, we have that. And Lord, there's no excuse, there's no reason why we should ever take anything to the, uh, to, uh, the judgment seat of Christ. Uh, Lord, I know there's going to be things there, wood, hay, and stubble. I know that. But Lord, most everything we should be able to take care of. And Lord, you've given us a way. I thank you for a story in the Old Testament about Jacob bringing his sons before him, Lord, because each and every one of us are. And I know Jacob didn't appreciate that and didn't want to do it, but he had to do it. He had to stand in the place of you, and he did exactly what he should have done. And, Lord, one day you'll stand there and you'll do what you're supposed to do. Lord, help us to get those things right. And bless us now, Father, and we'll praise you and honor you in Jesus' name. Amen.